Well, good morning again to everybody. As many of you know, I often refer to the minor prophets as the not so minor prophets. I do that for a reason, um, and that's because contained within these books, what God has recorded for us is anything, anything but minor. There are many, many lessons for God's people in the book of Haggai. Uh, in thinking about the book and rereading it, which I've been doing for the last few weeks, going over and studying it, I kept asking myself, okay, which direction should I go for this message for this Sabbath with the book of Haggai? I've had classes on the book, uh, weeks to study it years ago. I've heard multiple Bible studies, sermon messages, lectures on the book of Haggai. Some fellowships and churches use verses of this message to proclaim their mission statement, if you will. And that's fine. And probably correct with the verse and the focus that they use. But there's so much more in the book of Haggai that we might simply read right over. And you might want to uh, head that direction uh, to try to turn to it. You know, I'm watching pages turn as everybody's trying to remember where Haggai is. And I, I get that because uh, my pages are all sticking together. I've got it written in my notes. So it comes after uh, Zephaniah. And in my Bible, it is page number 1013. <laughs> uh, Haggai comes before Zechariah, which, as you know, uh, comes before Malachi, and then you're done with the not so minor prophets. But, but there's so much more in the book of Haggai that many simply read right over. By the way, if you want to understand the background of the book better, I'd suggest you read Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, because those give you the context, the background of what was going on, what happened. But I want to look closely at this book today, which I think you're going to find from a little different perspective. Not to worry, we'll be sticking to the truth of God's word, but perhaps something you haven't thought about. And if you stay with me through this to the end, the last couple sentences, at least after what I've been studying and, and looking at, will be pretty profound. So you've got to stay awake till the end. Uh, there, I'll give you something to have a goal for. Now, I'm not one to get hung up on dates. Um, within the pages of the Bible or the Word of God, relatively few dates are mentioned. By dates, I don't mean fruit. I don't mean going out with someone of the opposite sex. But time-wise, dates. If I were to say, what is today's date? This is December 31st, 2022 in the Gregorian calendar, or man's calendar. Um, but at times, dates become incredibly important and insightful, especially when God mentions them. When God mentions something specific, we need to take note of that. And because of this, and because God works in similar patterns, and many prophecies have a dual fulfillment, you've probably heard that many times over or studied that, what we find is when prophetic dates are mentioned they take on a special significance, and it's important we don't just glance right over them. Now, just so you know, I'm not going to tell you the date of Christ's return because I have no idea, and I couldn't find that out if I wanted to. I, could, I read so many papers over the years that came in um, of people, page after page, college ruled, explaining exactly when Christ was going to come back. Uh, God says, no man knows, not even he himself, but God the Father. So if somebody did figure it out and enough people were told, God would probably say, well, we're going to move it. Tut, tut, tut. <laughs> but those dates when God mentions them take on a special significance. It's important we don't just glance over them. And so we find in the book of Haggai, it is one that is noted for its exactly dated prophecies. Do you know that? Have you thought about that? Specifically, its last 
two prophecies, and stay with me here, are given on and revolve around the 24th day of the ninth month, a day known simply as Kislev, or Chislev, if pending. Kislev 24. Now, why, you might ask, is that important? Oh, no, he's gone Jewish on us, right? No, not at all. But you might ask, why is that date, Kislev 24, important? I want to talk about that today, because when we get to the end of the sermon and I wrap this together, you're going to say, wow, just like I did. Kislev falls during the month of November and December on the Gregorian calendar near the beginning of winter. Right now, here in the Northern Hemisphere, we are in winter, if you will. It may not feel like it today here in Lower Alabama, but last week it did. No question for us here. And most of the nation last week, a good part of the nation, knew exactly it was winter. If you doubted that, you can look at what we just had. Uh, we were cold here. Uh, the neighbor's plants, whatever those are called right over there, are all dead. <laughs> the grass went from green and growing to brownish and not so growing. Uh, we covered a lot of things, and we'll see. Some of them lost some things already. I went and trimmed that off. So this date, Kids Lab 24, is easy to calculate because it's always the day before many of the Jews celebrate their national holiday of Hanukkah, okay, which is Kislev 25. You're like, you're not going to go off on Hanukkah. No, I'm not. I'm just saying that's how you know it's always the day before many of the Jews celebrate their national holiday of Hanukkah. So let's take a minute. Let's look at history. I know Joe Jacoby likes history, and he will probably say, well, you could have added this, and you could have added that. A lot of people like history. I like history. Um, the old song, Don't Know Much About History. You remember that song? Don't know much about the class I took, but I do know. I could sing it for you, but don't know much about the French I took. I didn't take French. I took Spanish. So, But historically, Kislev 24 has been highly significant on a number of occasions. It was on Kislev 24 the temple was freed from the grasp of Antiochus Epiphanes. The cleansing of the temple that was desecrated by Antiochus began that evening, which, since it was after sunset, was technically Kislev 25. So this historical event constitutes the origin of Hanukkah. I might insert here, as I said during the announcements, Hanukkah is not a holy day commanded by God to observe. It's not even commanded that the Jewish people observe it. But I'll leave that lest we get sidetracked some. Uh, and I mentioned there's an article on the CGM website. Uh, it's under the drop-down menu, library slash resources, Bible questions and answers, where we go into more details on Hanukkah. But here's an interesting lesser-known fact. It was also on Kislev 24 in 1917, before most of us were born, during World War I, before all of us were born, I would say, that are here anyway, the British troops liberated Jerusalem from the Ottoman Empire. Just as the temple was destroyed on the same date, AV 9, on two different occasions, hundreds of years apart, the temple also had been liberated from foreign hands on the same date, Kislev 24. And because Kislev 24 has been highly momentous in the history of Jerusalem, and the temple, the appearance of the date in Haggai may be significant again. I said may because someone's going to say, well, you can't be emphatic on that. When you consider the dualities of the prophecies that we read in Haggai, the first Kislev 24 prophecy found in Haggai chapter 2, and let's turn there, Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 to 19, concerns the uncleanness of the covenant people and God's response to it. Let's read that. Haggai chapter 2, verse 10. In the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month, which would have been December, in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
Ask now the priest concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread, or soup, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said unanimously, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body, touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So if this people and this nation before me says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean, okay, they're unclean to start with, by the way. You and I are unclean to start with. And now I pray you consider from this day upward or forward from before a stone was laid upon a stone of the temple of the Lord, since those days where one came to an heap of 20 measure, there were but 10. When one came to the press fat for the draw of the 50 vessels of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hands, that you turned not to me, says the Lord. Consider now from this day and upward or forward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from that day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree has not brought forth. From this day will I bless you. Now, through a series of questions that Haggai asked the priests, God makes a profound point. Listen to this, please. Uncleanness is transferable. But holiness is not. Let me repeat that. Uncleanness is transferable, but holiness is not. Defilement or impurity can spread from an object to a person to another object, but purity and holiness cannot. I find this especially relevant in light of what was happening at that time. The people and the leaders <coughs> were in the process of building the dwelling place of the holy God. There's a whole other sermon here that could be given on what was happening right here is recorded. It contained a number of objects that were also holy, as well as the most holy place. Yet even the presence of God could not by itself make the people clean. Did you hear what I said? Even God's presence in the temple could not make the people clean. In order to make the nation clean, it would take something more than just having the temple nearby with all of its holy objects and even the glory of the living God. Something else was required to cleanse the people. The prophecy also has a really curious, interesting ending. It does not just contain a call to repentance. Some have thundered, you need to build a new temple and correct, correct, slam, yell, yell, holler, chastise. That's not all the book says. It's very important to understand that because some of us have grown up in this way of life or been part of this for so long, it becomes a list of don'ts and do's, and if you don't do it, you're in trouble. You're bad. We miss what the book of Haggai, in my opinion, is focusing on for all of us. And if we're not careful, you can become what's called legalistic. You don't eat pork, you keep the Sabbath, from, you don't work on the Sabbath, you do all these things, but your heart is not where God wants it. And you don't realize what God says here. He says, he comes out and he definitely chastises, but then he says what? Well, I want to get ahead of myself, so let's keep going. The presence of God by itself did not make the people clean. In order to make the nation, the people clean, it would take something more than just having the temple nearby. with all of its holy objects. This prophecy's ending, it says, it does not just contain a call to repentance, okay, it does 
have that in there by implication strongly. But here's where it gets interesting. God says his people are unclean. Do you think I could say that now? Yes. Yeah, how'd you do this week? <laughs> how'd you do this month? How'd you do this year? You got the old graph that goes like this. Right? <laughs> the Christian life. <clears throat> and his people are unclean. The presence of something holy cannot make them clean. And that their hearts were not turned to him. You've heard the saying, you talk the talk, but you don't, or, you don't walk the walk. You talk about it. I've seen some of your posts on Facebook. You know? You need to live it. You need to be it. And so he suddenly announces that from this day where he says they're unclean and all these things, I read this at first and I said, what did he just say? Chapter or verse 19, you have not brought forth, but from this day I will bless you. Wait a minute. He's not blessing them for disobeying him. Don't think I said that for a moment. What is this? Yes, he said he would bless. In this first prophecy, God does not specific, specify exactly what the blessing will be. In this first prophecy, he just says, I will bless you. Here's a hint. Let's go back to verse 19. Here's a hint through, though, in verse 19. Is the seed still in the barn? As yet, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive trees have not yielded fruit, but from this day I will bless you. What does that mean? What does that mean? This hint will become much clearer after we examine the next prophecy. Because the second Kislev 24 prophecy is recorded in Haggai chapter 2, right after this, verse 20 to 23. Let's read this too. He says, from this day will I bless you. Here we now come to, because there's four parts in this book of Haggai. Now here's the second prophecy. Again the word of the Lord came into Haggai in the fourth and twentieth day of this month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of kingdoms and the heathen. I will overthrow the chariots, those that ride in them, the horses, the riders, shall come down every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will make you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and I will make you a signet, for I have chosen thee, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? I will make of you a signet. This spells out a readily identifiable blessing, does it not? Righteous leadership. Verse 23 singles out Zerubbabel. Now, interesting here, my seal of approval, a signet. And I want to talk about this because this we can read right over and miss it. There may be a number of lesser fulfillments of this. It's important, though, to recognize the ultimate fulfillment of Zerubbabel's role is what? Jesus the Christ. That's the ultimate fulfillment. Zerubbabel was the governor of Judah after the Babylonian captivity. And let's go to Matthew chapter 1 because there's an interesting, uh, will help us here. Matthew chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. And after they were brought to Babylon... Jeconias begat Salathiel, and Salathiel begat Zerubbabel. And Zerubbabel begat Abidu, Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim, and Eliakim begat Azor. All right, you're thinking, okay, what does that have to do with anything? Because if you look at this, and you keep going, you have the Davidic line. So he was also part of Jesus Christ's lineage on Joseph's side. So that lineage carried down from what he says here with Zerubbabel 
Zerubbabel in the book of Haggai also typifies Christ, our perfect governor and ruler. You know, with all the politics going on, elections and all the governors that were trying to win different locations during the last few weeks, months, um, I keep going back that the perfect governor, the perfect ruler is who? Jesus the Christ. And I don't think we can fathom completely what that's going to be like. Well, number one, we have the influence of Satan missing. And then the perfect governor. You know? He always makes the right decision and does the right thing in every situation. We've never had that. Never. Well, we've had it in the church. I heard a man one time, well, the ministry of the church does that. Oh, that's funny. You know? You know, we don't. And so God chose Zerubbabel and his descendant, his most important descendant, to be his signature ring, the seal of approval. The king had a ring, okay, that he would use and he would dip some hot wax on a document, would roll it up and dip it, and then he would impress in that and take it out. And it left that was you knew, that's where we get the word character, Right? When you say we need godly character, we need that seal of approval. And he said here, this Zerubbabel received God's seal, but John 6, 27, let's, let's, well, let me see, let's back up. Zerubbabel typifies Christ, our perfect governor ruler. Zerubbabel, let's go to Matthew 12, since we're in Matthew. Zerubbabel is called God's servant. But let's see what Matthew 12, 18 says. We've got several scriptures here. Matthew 12 and verse 18. Behold, my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, and whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. So here we're talking about Jesus Christ. So Zerubbabel was called God's servant, so was Jesus Christ. John 13, 16. John 13 and verse 16. Truly, truly, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So here again, referring to God's servant. Acts chapter 3, verse 13. Let's look at that. Acts 3, 13. The God of Abraham, Isaac, of Jacob, of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Acts chapter 4, just want to take a, a quick skim here, verse 27. For a truth against your holy child, Jesus, that Greek word for child is paidos. It better in this context is the word servant. For of truth against your holy servant Jesus, whom you have anointed Herod the Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. Um, let's look at verse 30. By stretching forth your hand to heal and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy, again the word servant, Jesus. Romans chapter 15, let's work in Acts, let's just go another book over and then we'll move forward. Acts chapter 15, uh, excuse me, Romans 15 and verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a servant of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto their fathers. So Zerubbabel was called God's servant, but Jesus Christ over and over was called his servant as well. Zerubbabel, as we read in the book of Haggai, also was chosen. He was selected by God specifically, but so was Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 12, 18, we read that just a few minutes ago. Let's go to Luke chapter 23, verse 35. Giving you Bible burn today. Luke chapter 23, verse 35. And the people stood before, beholding, and the rulers with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And then 1 Peter 2, verse 4. 
back a few pages, 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 4. I normally don't pull the right page out, but this happened three times in a row. I just turned and there it is, so I'll slow down. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 4. To whom coming is unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. So yes, Zerubbabel was chosen, but Jesus Christ was as well. Interestingly, Zerubbabel, as we read in Haggai, received God's seal. But let's look at John chapter 6 and verse 27. Let's see what it says here. John 6 and verse 27. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but for that food which endures unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him has God the Father sealed, given his seal of approval, his signet, if you will. So you've got a, a duality here with Zerubbabel and Jesus Christ. God chose Zerubbabel and his descendants, his most important descendant, to be his signature ring, his seal of approval. There was no doubt that God, if you remember, he said, this day, you know, I am well pleased, my son. God set his seal on Zerubbabel, but more importantly, he set his seal on Zerubbabel's descendant, the Messiah, which trumps that, if you will. And I have to be careful to use that word because it has a whole different meaning these days. But if you're playing a card game and you say, okay, you got a really good hand, I trump that, you know. I'm better than that. Here's my hand. That was not a political statement, just a statement at the Messiah was the greatest seal of approval. When we understand that, we better understand the imagery of Haggai chapter 2, verse 19. Remember this, Kislev 24 is in the winter. This will make a lot more sense for you up in Minnesota and New York and Washington and Idaho and South Dakota, some of the places. This will make more sense because it's still colder there. I know a good friend of mine is traveling to Rapid City today or yesterday or this morning, hoping to get there, do what he has to do and get home the five and a half, six hours uh, before the storms hit. Kislev 24 is in the winter. It's a time of short days and long nights. Who remembers when in, with our calendar, is the shortest day of the year? Anybody? December 23rd, 1st. Okay. You know, right, right around there. So we're now getting longer days. You can tell the sun's out, at least down here. We know that we're over the halfway point, if you will, and it's going to start getting longer days. And then once they get to a certain point of length, then they're going to just tack on an extra hour and just add whatever. So that really messes us up again. But So it's in the winter. The harvesting has been done. This is for Kislev 24. The harvesting has been done. Everyone hopes that enough has been stored up to last in the vines, the trees, the crops beginning to produce fruit again. I learned growing up in the Midwest, in Nebraska, that even in a good year, okay, even in a good year, winter is not usually a time of blessing. I talked to my mom yesterday. She said, well, the snow is almost gone, and it's going to get up to 40. Well, that's the winter thaw they have up in Nebraska. Although where they live, it's generally better. But where my kids live up in Mankato, they're in the midst of winter. They took some pictures for us and sent them to us. They said, don't let these pictures deceive you. It's like five above. <laughs> snow everywhere. So it's winter. And winter's not usually a time of blessing. I'm sorry, I lived in it multiple times. I, the coldest I've ever been, we called it winter peg, was in Winnipeg, Manitoba, served up there, and that's just cold. Remember the one time we spent all day driving around seeing ice sculptures, trying to keep the windshield to, from freezing on the inside, and looking at ice sculptures, and I said, how long have these been up here? Oh, about five months, <laughs> four months, you know? That's hard for us down here to fathom, but I, I can tell you, I, winter is not usually a time of blessing. Spiritually, it can be. We're focused, but how many of us, did you go out last Sunday and just do yard work because it was beautiful out? 
you know? That's why we can stay cooped inside. And we just, why go outside? It's cold, you know? Going out for a dinner somewhere. Anybody experience that? I have. Remember one time in Urbandale, Des Moines, we went out with that steak place with a couple? That was like five, ten below zero. The wind was blowing. We get in the car, ah, even with a jacket. Finally get to the restaurant. You go in. The fire's burning. It's warm. We have a wonderful meal. Then you come out and you open the door like, ah. and you get in the car. Rawr, rawr, rawr. By the time you get home, you're finally starting to warm up. Then you got to get out and go inside again. And it's like, I don't want to go out and eat. I don't care how nice it is. Because you got to go back out and face that. It's wintertime. God chose this coldest and bleakest of times to start his blessing. I would like all of us to consider a thought as we move through this message. And bear with me. It is at our bleakest and most difficult, hardest times of this physical life that God starts blessings for us. And I'm telling you, okay, I'm telling you, you, once you understand how God thinks, it takes you to a different place. Um, I've been through times in my life, you have too, I'm looking out at you guys, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it, but it's the going through it. And but God picks the coldest and bleakest and when things seemed impossible for a blessing. And you look back, okay? I look back and say, thank you, God, for what I had to go through. But I'm not about to tell you that I'm there completely, that I might not tomorrow say the old hee-haw song, Pain, despair, and agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. We're human. Even Jesus Christ, what did he say? Father, if there be another way. Then he caught himself and said, no, your will be done. And when you get to that point, this is part of what Haggai is talking about. He said, you have done all this. You have, your temple is defiled. You're not, you don't get it. But he says, you know what? You have to change that. But he said, I'm going to bless you. Have you ever told someone, your child, maybe when you're really correcting them, you know, all this is going to happen. But by the way, this is a blessing. Trust me. Why is that a blessing? Right? A blessing whose greatest fulfillment would be found in the perfect leadership, the work, and the cleansing sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It sets up a very interesting possibility I would like us to think about. Jesus Christ was very likely and probably born sometime in the fall. Not in the middle of winter, folks or December, as most of the Christian world believes. He was not born on December 25th. You can prove that from history, from the calendar, from all of the different things where he was born. He was not. Believe what you want. That's your choice between you and God. But he was not born then. He was probably born in the fall. And if we count back nine months from when he was born, we arrive at a date in the winter. I suggest it is possible. Remember our friend from Columbia? It's possible. It's possible. Remember? That Kislev 24 could be the date when the power of the Most High God overshadowed Mary and caused her to conceive the Messiah. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. It's something to think about. I wouldn't base my life on it with doctrine, but with all the other things with Kislev 24, it's very possible. Luke chapter 1 and verse 35. You know the verse. And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you and the power of the highest. That Holy Spirit is that power, shall overshadow you. Therefore the holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. A 
A play on words in verse 19 of Haggai seems to support this. The question is asked, is the seed still in the barn? The word translated as seed is elsewhere translated in God's word as child or posterity. The name Zerubbabel means seed of Babylon or planted in Babylon. More importantly, when God told Abraham, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Let's read those. Genesis 22 and verse 18. I told you you probably hadn't thought about this before. If you have, I'd be surprised. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 18. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And then Genesis 28 and verse 14. And your seed shall be as the dust of the earth and shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. And in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So the seed that God was referring to was what? Jesus Christ, 42 generations later. Haggai chapter 2, verse 19, I believe is describing a time when the seeds from the previous harvest, they're not in the barn because they have been planted, but it is before any fruit was produced. It could also then describe a child who has been conceived but not yet born. And through that child, the blessing of cleansing and the leadership would come for Judah, Israel, the church, and eventually what? The entire world. I have yet to hear someone give a message about the book of Haggai that talks about what Jesus Christ came for and what he is making available. If we'll just listen and stop focusing so much on the physical temple, but the spiritual temple. Because Paul said, we are the temple of the living God. If Jesus Christ were conceived on this date, it would be a remarkable fitting application of what God says when he says in there, from this day I will bless. I'm going to end a little bit early today. As Kislev, as significant as Kislev 24 is, and it is significant, if for no other reason than that is, it is mentioned, directly or indirectly, five times in one chapter. Five times. And as significant, and I told you, I would make a couple statements that I want you to listen to. As significant as it may have been again in the future, we do not have to wait for winter for God's blessing. God is already blessing us on a daily basis. It may not be physically. We may be suffering, okay? I had surgery on August 12th. It is now coming up close to January 12th. And the defuddlement of what has happened, because I'm not healing. We have all kinds of theories. Maybe it's because God wants me to look at it as a blessing instead of a pain in my hind end, actually a pain in my knee. I have to think about that. I have to seriously consider it. Um, we don't have to wait for God's blessing. God blesses us on a daily basis, but do we miss it? However, might we consider that he is not just blessing us for our own sakes. He is blessing all of those who he has called, so that through, listen carefully, the cleansing that we have, the high priest that we have, the Holy Spirit that we have, 
and the pure and clean hearts we are developing because Christ is doing that and God is doing that. Our lives may be a testimony. And here's the SPS of what God is willing to do for his children. What God is willing to do for his children, you and me, and ultimately for the world. To me, that is profound. Of what God says, I will bless you. The significance of that. All this focus on Jesus, baby Jesus, in Christmas. I think we would have done better to read the book of Haggai and think about what is it when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that none should perish. That's incredible to me. What he says from this day will I bless. Hang on, because you know what the future holds? This is what's really encouraging to me. We don't know. I'm looking at Victoria. We don't know where you and I, Nada, Gail, none of you, we don't know where we're going to be a year from now. We can surmise and guess and plan, but we don't have any guarantees. But this blessing promised Jesus Christ came. It gave us the opportunity through that cleansing. His blood cleansed us. The high priest that we have that can be touched with all of our infirmities. The Holy Spirit that we have through the indwelling of that. And the pure and clean hearts that he can develop in us that we can't do by ourselves. Sorry, you can't. You can't keep the Sabbath holy enough, eat the right food, live everything, pray and fast and study enough to have a pure heart. Only God could do that. But by developing that, our lives could be a testimony. And God could say, I said I would bless you. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. So join me in prayer if you would. Our Father in heaven, God, we come before you. We thank you, Father. We don't understand everything, of course, but our limited, puny human minds. But yet they are far above any other thing that's ever been created. Chimp, pig, horse, whatever you want to pick. You know, and yet with the indwelling of your spirit, Father, you have opened our minds to your truth. We have a responsibility to to keep that faithful, to hang on to it, to live it. But Father, when we go through these difficulties, these challenges, these trials as we call them, Father, many are suffering. Your purpose, your ultimate will is being done. And Father, I'm sure that many in Haggai felt very chastised and realized there was no way. And yet before he finished, he says, I will bless you. It's hard to see the blessing sometimes as we go. The old saying, it's hard to remember your initial objective is to drain the swamp when you're up to your hind end and alligators. Father, be with us, encourage us, lift us, strengthen us, fill us with your spirit, give us hope. The world doesn't have a lot of hope in it right now. But even the world, you have said, if you will turn to me, I will bless you. And I have already given my son's life so that you have that opportunity in the time of your calling and when you deem it the right time. Father, thank you. Please dismiss us. Bless the meal. Bless everyone here. Please be with Victoria and Lamar and Martha and the many others, Father, that need you. Be with Harry and Lorna as they recover from COVID down in Texas. Be with your children. Father, help them to understand and realize that this relationship with you transcends everything else no matter how difficult it could be. We ask for your dismissal. We love you and thank you again. Go with us, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.